is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Hook Shots Podcast. I am your host, Joe Cermelli. Today is January 21st, and uh, we are going to fire up the auger and uh, get those blades of steel spinning in audio form uh, and hit the ice. Yes, sir. So I have long underwear on. Uh, even though I'm in the house, in the office here, because winter hath arrived here in the Northeast. It's um, it's officially frigid, which for our buds across the Midwest and upper Midwest and such, it's like, yeah, congrats, man. It's been, uh, it's been winter here since September. I know, I know. And you all have been getting some ice fishing in, I see. A lot of pictures. I know you guys are out there on the hard water. And I feel like I'd be remiss if we didn't do um, an ice podcast, right? It it is it is ice fishing season, and I'm jealous of you guys, right? Believe it or not, because I actually really enjoy ice fishing. Okay, that's a fact. But considering that I live in like what has apparently become like this weird temperate zone now, um, ice around the way is never a guarantee, or uh, rather, I should say, fishable ice is never a guarantee, but it is a guarantee that it'll at least get cold enough, long enough to crush any hope uh, or dreams you've had about uh, sneaking in some more open water days. I can't tell you how many times I've trucked to some pickerel pond uh, with a bucket of shiners in tow just to get there and go, son of a bitch, over like two millimeters of ice that um, you can barely detect with the naked eye. You know, you cast a jerk bait out there and it just, fuck off. Anyway, it's been a few years um, since we froze over solid enough here in Jersey to have like a, you know, a really long extended ice season. And um, while I enjoy it very much, right, I have to admit two things, okay? One, um, other than a couple ice fishing rods and reels, I own no gear, okay? I have so much shit in my garage already that, that there just isn't room for like sleds and augers and a pile of tip-ups and the like. So I am uh, the classic ice moocher. I will leech on to the ice party of anyone who has all these wares, but left to my own devices, um, I'd, have, I'd have a lot of stocking up to do. So I've never gone ice fishing um, alone, nor been like the leader of the dog sled team, okay? I have to glom on to somebody else's gig, all right? And second fun fact, uh, I am a sissy when it comes to ice and will only go on the ice when it can be proven to me that it will support um, a juvenile sperm whale, which weighs about what I do, okay? And that's uh, mildly exaggerated, but I've never been the first dude on the ice, all right? Um, never. And this reminds me of, of a time I joined my dear friend Frank Heater on a hard water adventure a few years ago when we did have ice, um, and Frankie does a lot more ice fishing than I do, but I talked him into trying a pond that I liked, right, uh, where neither of us had ever ice fished before. And we got there, and I was like, well, one of us should go out there and drill a hole, um, and by one of us, I mean you. And he did. He walked out uh, on this tiny snow-covered pond, right, to, like, to the, the dead center of it, made like a quarter of a turn with a hand auger and it just punched right through. And I'll never forget, like I'm, I'm on the bank, like nervous for him. And, uh, he just looks at me from the middle of the pond and he just goes, it ain't very thick. And then he briskly trotted off the ice as it like spider cracked under him. And he thankfully, he thankfully made it back. Okay. Because had he gone through, I would have felt like that was, that was my fault. Because I picked the spot, right? So I, I would have, I would have felt really terrible. So you know, I hear lots of people um, kind of come down on tip-up fishing, right? But I got to tell you, I really enjoy it, right? I, I, I think having five tip-ups, six tip-ups out there spread all over the place, you know, watching for flags, running for them, I think that's a blast, right? And it's kind of like. Um, I don't know. It's like, it's like bobber and worm fishing in open water. It's like, yeah, you, you know, you might come down on that or think like, you know, you're better than that or you know, more, I'm a hardcore jig guy. But like, if you don't find that fun, like if you can't like take yourself out of your hardcoreness and in, enjoy a bobber going down or a flag going up, like, come on, man, what's wrong with you? That's fun. 
That's good, clean American fun. I mean, for God's sakes, Matthew McConaughey is tip up fishing out of his Lincoln these days, right? Y'all seen that commercial? Have you ever looked that f***ing put together on the ice? I haven't. It's like armpit steam escaping from your jacket. Your hair is soaked from sweat under a woolen cap that, like, you need to throw out when you get home. But you never did. You just keep wearing the same one. It's got, like, you know, trip after trip, season after season worth of your sweat just caked into the wool. Your nose is pouring clear mucus into your mouth, running over your lip and into your mouth all day. You're wiping that on your sleeve. You know, somebody grilled brats. But you got nothing to wipe the mustard off your face with, so you just leave it there. It's like licking mustard off your face. Anyway, McConaughey looked like he might have actually smelled good, you know, which is lies. But anyway, look, I like tip-ups, but I certainly like jigging too. Um, and I, I love ice fishing electronics. I, I, for some people, like, ah, I don't know, freaking electronics, you go out, you drill a hole. Yeah, 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 right. Flashers, cameras, some say that's cheating. You know, the serious guys don't. But I, I know if you handful of guys... And when they're like, ah, I don't need a flasher, it's just like, I don't know, to me, it's it's like it's like a long-winded way of saying you don't want to pony up the money for a flasher. But anyway, I think it's fun. I think it enhances the experience, right? Using them to find fish aside, some of the most fun I've ever had on the ice was watching pickerel on a camera that was trained on a shiner below a tip-up. That was Hours of entertainment, like flags are popping all around, and I'm like, I'm not leaving this one. I'm watching this pick roll. Hours of entertainment, and I think it teaches you a lot. Like some of those fish would sit there, arched up, angled down in a strike position for ten to fifteen minutes, just looking at the bait. And the bait gets nervous, and then it stops getting nervous, and it gets nervous again, and the pick roll moves an inch forward, and you know, like. To me, it's fascinating, and and you learn from that. Like you know, with all species, bass, pickerel, pike, whatever, you know, you have this idea of like, oh, reaction bites. You know, when you're throwing lures, and yeah, and that's true, reaction bites. But at the same time, like, there's a live shiner dancing around on a tether, and you're watching these pickerel, which are supposed to be dummies, right? They eat anything, just like waiting for something, like figuring the whole thing out, and sometimes. Out of nowhere, for no apparent reason, just boom, boom, and be flag up. And then sometimes after sitting there for 10 minutes, they would just peel away. And it makes you wonder, like, what did he not like? Why did he not eat that? And I don't have those answers, and you don't either, um, I don't think. But just point being, I think I think that all those, those electronics, like, it, it makes it more fun to me, okay? Uh, however, the most fun that I have ever, 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 ever had on ice was actually the first time I ever fished on ice. And this is going back quite a few years now um, on Lake Granby in Granby, Colorado. And I was there with my good pal, Tim Romano, who's been on this show several times. And we were fishing with guide Bernie Keefe, who is our guest today. And the target on that trip was lake trout. Now, as we're going to learn here, right, Bernie is a trophy hunter. Okay, his whole shtick, his entire career has been focused on catching the biggest, baddest Lakers in that lake. And I remember I was very excited to fish with him uh, because I also really, really just love lake trout. I love lake trout. You know, in some places that I fish, like the Niagara River comes to mind, like for steelhead and stuff, there's Lakers mixed in. And like a lot of guys, they're a nuisance. I love lake trout. And I, you know, I think part of that is just that um, I don't really have good lake trout opportunities really close to home, okay? There are some, and I'm going to talk about that more later, but I mean, there's, there's you know, lake trout for me, you're, 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 you're doing four or five hours, six, seven hours in the car to get to really good stuff. So I don't get to target them um, that often, but you know, it's tough to be introduced to ice fishing jigging 40 plus inch lake trout and then going to yellow perch down the street right it's it's just not the same experience man although i think it's fair to say that for most ice fishermen you know considering that it's cold and the conditions and it takes some effort to lug your gear out and all that stuff i mean i know the midwest crew you got your shanties out there you kind of post up but even you guys i i think 
um, in, in a big way. Like the, the average guy that, that ice fishes wants to catch something, okay? You're out there, you want action, whether it's a bunch of perch or walleyes or pickerel or bass, you want action, right? And I think it's harder to sort of be a risk taker on the ice and be willing to scratch for the opportunity to maybe catch something that's like really a stunner, okay? Now, as we'll learn from Bernie, that mentality is is starting to change more and more. But even though on, on pretty much any given day on his home water, he can produce numbers, right? For, for over 30 years on the ice there, he's stuck to his guns on quality, okay? He's also a very experimental angler, and a lot of his methods and philosophies I think can help some of you Maybe change up your program a little bit or at least inspire you to say, okay, you know what? Like, let's just skip the perch school today and do things a little different and maybe get a big laker or a big brown or walleye or pike or musky, whatever. Because I got to tell you, as much fun as I've had on the ice chasing smaller targets, okay, and having those fast action days, fishing through a tiny hole and connecting to a target that is taking line so hard and so fast, I mean, just uh, that literally made me look at Bernie and go, holy shit, man, when is this fish going to stop? Was one of the coolest fishing experiences, period, that I've ever had. And once you have it, you look at those tip-up pickerel just a little bit differently. Bernie? Bernie Keefe. What is going on, man? Joe Cermelli. What the hell? What the hell? You what the hell? <laughs> How you doing? Good, man. How are you? You were, you were, uh, you're all, you're all like relaxed now, right? You were on the ice today, yeah? I was on the ice and I am one fried puppy. I think I have like 13 <laughs> days in a row in. Well, okay. Fried, fried in the sense of being tired, but also I remember when I fished with you, Despite it being winter, I had like the worst sunburn of my entire life fishing on Granby in that trip. And that's what happens. Nobody realizes that 8,000 feet closer to the sun than you guys are. Yep. Affects. And then everybody goes that we go down to Florida and people are like, oh, you got to be careful of the sun down there. I'm like, <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> yeah, man. I remember, I remember being cooked. But anyway, so dude, how you're burned out, but is it, is, is it worth it? How's fishing? Fish it, you got to work really hard. We're getting, a, oh, a bite or two every day, or not, a fish or two, large fish every day. Right. Um, on a good day, you might get four or five, uh, but you got to work real hard, and you have to be so focused on everything, because you're only going to get an opportunity if everything's perfect, and even them, them, them fish will just sit there and swim right away from you right now well okay so like, yeah but at the same time man this is why i want to talk to you because you're the focused trophy guy which i feel like a lot of people in ice fishing sort of are not but um i i do have to ask man how is lisa how is how is your lovely wife and is she still fishing with you and is she still uh, a fish machine oh my wife is doing awesome you know um she will take a rod and just beat you down with it with the size of fish to the amount of fish she catches <laughs> uh she'll go fishing with my friends and she, she she's just telling them what's up and showing them how all day long yeah um she is an amazing woman an amazing fisher lady and an incredible wife i cannot say enough good things about her well i, I remember so in the early part of, of my visit she uh she she pretty much spanked me and our mutual friend tim romano who was with us, but uh, th dude, does she still work for Southwest? Because I remember she told me, like, if you ever see me on a flight, you know, say hi, I'll give you free drinks, or sometimes you can even drop my name and and, and they'll get you free drinks. And I, I don't fly Southwest much, but I tried that once, and I was like, yeah, I, I uh, I'm a friend of Lisa Keefe's, <laughs> and the lady was like, okay, I guess it was like the wrong route or something. <laughs> but, yeah, but I tried. Give me your credit card. <laughs> Yeah, she still works for Southwest. As a matter of fact, she's coming home from a trip now. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I remember, um, yeah, because she's away and then home, and she just happened to be there when we were filming, and you were like, my wife's coming out. I was like, oh, badass. And then she 
uh, whooped our asses for the whole front half of that trip. So that was cool. Um, <laughs> you, you guys were the coolest husband and wife team that I've ever fished with. And I've fished with a few husband and wife teams, and you well, guys were, you. The, were the most badass. So uh, I've uh, I've known you for a while now, and you are the man on Granby. That is that is uh, that is a clear fact. But you know, I don't remember if I ever asked you, man. Like, are are you from Colorado originally, Bernie? Like, has has this been a lifelong home water, or did you start this whole crazy fish thing somewhere else? Well, I'm I'm from Westminster, the suburbs of Denver. Okay, okay. And um and then um I've been. All I've my whole life, all I've really known was fishing and nothing else. Right, right. And then I I started coming up to the mountains, and I just liked it so much that I got a job in white water treatment. Um, then my truck broke down, and the guy who was fixing my truck asked me if I wanted to guide for him, and <laughs> I said, "Sure, why me?" And he goes, "You're the only one dumb enough to be out there every day." And <laughs> so that was the start of a wonderful career. Dude, that's awesome! I didn't know that. Damn, man. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it was it was just so funny. I mean, you look back at it, on everything and how things come together. And, yeah, I, I became a fishing guide. I got led down this path because my I um I, my, I they needed a new, new motor in my truck. It broke down. We put a new motor in. And it broke down, like, in Granby? Well, it, had, it blew a head gasket. Uh-huh. And at the time, I thought if you blew a head gasket, you needed a whole new motor. Right. I'm not really bright with mechanics. I'm not bright with anything, but that's what I thought. I don't do cars either, so, man. I don't know. I pay the guy for that. Yeah, that's what I did. So we ended up getting the new motor and a career out of the deal. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, so so <laughs> Granby, like, just give me a little bit about it for those not familiar. I mean, I, you know, it, it is most well known for its lake trout fishing, right? It is. It sits up at 8,300 feet in the Rockies, um, northwest of Denver. We're at the west end of Rocky Mountain National Park. It in Colorado, it has the largest biomass of lake trout of any lake in the state. Um, we have an honest shot at ten to twenty pound fish out here. There's plenty of the sixteen to nineteen inch eaters. There's quite a few of that twenty to twenty six inch range. Um, and it, and it's not an easy fishery, but there's a lot of fish, so that kind of helps you out a little bit. The pressure gets pretty good up here, especially through the ice right uh there's rainbows in here there's browns and they started stocking a half million fingerling rainbows in the lake every year to boost the rainbow population it's laker food but what goes on <laughs> well that, that it's laker and what really has been helping is the brown trout we're getting oh last spring we got two 27 inch browns nice a uh, number of 23 and 24s the brown trout fishery up here is just off the charts and the the shape and the growth rates of the lake of the lake trout have have grown. It's been it's really been good that they're doing that for the entire lake. So, how many years have you been on Granby now? And I I ask that because, um, you know, I, I feel like it, it, it's a big lake, no doubt, but it, it's certainly not the biggest lake in the world. And I mean, you've you've focused your whole career on this this one body of water, which I feel like is fairly impressive in that, you know, a lot of guys bounce around, they have five different places going on and sort of gauge it. But I mean, you've basically been on this one lake, you don't hop around very much. I don't hop around. I have guides working for me that are working on the other lakes now. But I've been on Granby for somewhere 25 to 30 years. Wow. I've always had the attitude of no one lake and try to know it as good as you can sure that way if anything hiccups on you you have a lot of fallback history to fall back on sure sure well okay and and like that right there is is sort of like gets into the the mind of the, the trophy hunter that you are because i even remember when when we came out you know you had said when when i first called about you know how it's tough you're getting a couple bites a day you know maybe five fish is a good day and i i remember you clearly saying to us when we got there it's like there are two options here like we can i can put you on fish numbers of fish and we'll we'll catch a lot but they're not going to be very big or you you go all in on you know size and tim and i decided that we were we were size queens we went that route okay so i you know i always I think of you as a, a, a trophy lake trout specialist. And, you know, these days I assume that most of the people who book you, they're looking for those tanks and they understand the game and, and are willing to um, 
sacrifice, you know, a, a lot of fish and, and maybe strike out. Like they sort of know what they're they're in for now. Uh, most people, yeah, I, then you're exactly right. Uh, most people they want to come after them big fish, and that's people who do that usually book me about a year in advance. Right. Um, and it is, and it's just, and I warn everybody. I'm like my my line to everybody is. If you want to go after a big fish, are you willing to zero? Right. You're not going to get a lot of opportunities, and if you don't capitalize on every one of them, you're going to zero. And so if people say no to me there, then we we got to talk. But if they say, yes, we are, well, we're going to find out in the first three or four hours if you're really willing to. <laughs> now, if I remember right, uh, and and you have to tell me the rule because I don't remember the, the details, but what is it? You can't use live bait or 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 any natural bait at all in the winter on Granby or always on Granby, isn't it something like that? In Colorado, it, Colorado, it's above seventy five hundred feet or west of the Continental Divide. You cannot use any live bait. You cannot use any game fish's bait, even dead game fish. So you can't like catch small rainbows first and then drop them down deeper for the lake trout. No, oh boy, that'd be so much fun. Oh my gosh, but no, <laughs> no, you you go to jail. Don't stop. Don't pass go. <laughs> so that's what it is. So it's the altitude and 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 west of the divide. I couldn't remember, but I, I do remember because you know I, I looked at the whole thing and I thought like, man, like why aren't there you know, a shitload of guys out here dropping some kind of liveies. It seems like a no-brainer. But it's interesting because now you have this artificial-only deal, even on the ice, Um, yet, you know, that would, I think, be a turnoff for a lot of the guys, especially like sort of the tip-up culture. But they're still, uh, you know, pressured and difficult. I remember when we were out there, you said we're going to work a little extra hard because there had just been a, a tournament. So there's like frequent winter tournaments targeting these big fish, right? They don't target necessarily the big fish. It's just you get a thousand people on the lake for three days in a row. It really it, it hits everything, um, and enough big fish get caught out of there. And people, some people know it's where to target and how and all that stuff for the big fish. And some people just catch them by accident. So it does make the fishing tougher. And it's not exactly artificial only. Like you can use um, sucker meat. You can you can get some dead suckers and you can put those on tip ups. You can use carp and you can cut them up and you can strip and put strips on your jigs and stuff like that. Some guys like to use row sacks out here. That's legal, um, but it just can't be live. And through the years, we've really tried to get people to walk away from the whole tip up thing because that'll gut hook the fish they'll sure. swallow them sure so we've i've been one of my goals my whole career is to teach people they can catch big fish on a jig right right um just the plastic or tip it with a piece of sucker meat but teach them that they can catch these big fish and they can um they can release them this way and you know the whole selective harvest has been very important to me so selective harvest, just back up for one sec. Tell me, what, what does that mean exactly? How does that work? Well, you know, lake trout especially, whenever you get all these fish across the nation, if you start picking on all the biggest ones, you're going to lose that whole big fish thing. Sure. Whether it's bluegill, whether it's lake trout, tarpon, whatever. So like out here in the West, we have food problems. We have a lot of biological problems in our lakes, and our biologists do all these netting surveys. Okay. And – you can look online and you can see where the biggest group of fish are. And that's what I tell people. If you're going to harvest fish, look at these graphs and find out where the biggest group of fish, like in our lakes, are 17, 18 inches. I'm like, beat up on those. We need to knock those down. One thing about all these fish is when there's so many little ones and not a lot of big ones, the little ones eat all the food. They're just like teenagers in the house. They clean out the refrigerator, and when Dad comes home, there's nothing to eat. Right, right. So Dad has to eat a teenager. So if we wipe out some of the teenagers, and that's going to allow more of them to grow, and we're going to get a more healthy population of larger fish. So I'm a real staunch believer in do your research on your lake. Find out what size is the most is the best to keep to keep the population in check on the masses and then pick pick on that group of fish because, you know, like an 18-inch lake trout, that's a good meal. 
So for one person, you can take three or four of those and you get a meal for a family. Well, obviously then the way you're talking about this, obviously people are keeping them for food because I know in a lot of places, like um, I, I've, I've done a fair amount of fishing for Lake Trout in the Niagara River out of Lake Ontario as an example. Um, nobody wants them. Everybody says they're full of PCBs and oily and just don't taste good. But I, I know that that sort of varies by region. So these are a pretty popular food fish in Colorado. They really are. Now, we are limited on our food. So up, up here in the mountains, we're limited on we have trout, salmon, and lake trout. Right. So it, we're kind of limited. And the lake trout are pretty prolific up here. And those eater size, I think they're good. They have that, oh, what is that? vitamin in them that chemical that's good for your heart um that salmon has they have omega-3 right right they have that in the meat so they're good for you to eat um but you do have to be careful because they get so old they'll keep mercury in them and they keep they you know there's a lot of bad stuff in them older fish you probably don't want to eat but when you get in the younger fish people should try them in their waters they get an 18 inch lake trout they should take it home and cook it they might like it Interesting. I will have, yeah, I'll have to do that next time I'm up there because, you know, it, it's also just that there's so much salmon and steelhead culture there. It's like, well, if I want to eat something, that's, I'm, I want the king salmon or the steelhead. Why do I want that? So it's just interesting to hear that because I feel like out here, it's a lot more of like a, it's fun to catch, but I don't want to eat that kind of thing. So, in, you know, you say, you say you're going back 25, 30 years here. I remember, you know, I, I, had, I had sort of found you and found this fishery, and it was really intriguing to me because uh, I know for a long time, and I'm sure still now, you know, tubes that you would use for bass, like regular tube jigs, were uh, were very popular. And let, let's not get into what happened with us and how you guinea pig me with a certain lord just yet. <laughs> but I want to talk about. Be a guinea pig. <laughs> but I want to talk about your earlier days. So with that mantra of sort of getting people to understand that, you know, you can catch these really big fish in the winter through the ice and you, you don't need meat to do it. You know, where did the tube jigs come in and what came before them? You know, how did you start targeting those fish and, you know, have it lead into tubes? Well, tubes were around when I started. There's an older gentleman named Dick Gassaway who was down at Lake, Lake Powell and they were spooning stripers in the fall. They lost their last striper spoon, so we put on a tube and it was even better. And then right after that, his buddy was going to Flaming Gorge, and he told him, some of those with you. And so they, he brought them up, and they, he knocked them dead. And then Dick came out here on Granby, and he was guiding back in the day. And he was just tearing them up, and nobody could understand what he was doing. He had them all to himself for a couple of years, and word slowly got out. Right, right. And um, so I came around after that. I definitely didn't bring the tubes into the lake trout world. Sure. I did I did capitalize on the ability to use them. Um it it's been pretty it's been really good and I just started way back when using them and I couldn't hold a boat still to save my life on a calm day. So I just kind of learned this little technique, taught myself this little technique of walking the tubes around on the bottom and just kind of going real slow and looking for a fish, and it just really worked for me. Then I brought it into the ice, and I kind of had the same jigging cadence on the ice. And over the years, it kind of changed, and it, it morphed into different things. But at the end of the day, it was still the same cadence, just different speeds. And with the tubes, like um, there had to be something tied to the fall rate or the, 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 the position or posture when they fell. I mean, what about that presentation w was so much more knock them dead, do you think, than, you know, a classic spoon or metal or something like that? You know, I think it was just they fall at a little more horizontal, that the tentacles always wiggling up in the air. Um, just it looks like something falling dead through the water column. Right. And, and then once it gets on the bottom, the way it hops and scoops around, if you lay on the ice and you watch a tube on the bottom, if you're vertical jigging it, you can get it to imitate a nervous crawdad real fast. Right, sure. And so I think that's kind of what, what kicks it off. Well, I remember when we fished together, we, we started out with tubes, and, um, you know, I, I hear everyone, a fair amount, I would say, of, of ice guys, you know, 
talking about how, you know, you don't need a flasher, you don't need this, you know, keep it simple. And the, the, when I fished with you, it was the first time I'd ever been on the ice and used a flasher. And I've done it a lot since for other things. And like thinking about walleye fishing and stuff like that, right? I, I think it's like playing Nintendo and I have so much fun playing with a flasher. But when you're doing something like walleye or perch, you know, you have a lot of clutter and there's sort of a lot going on, which is cool in its own right. But I remember we were in water so deep that like if you saw a mark, I mean, you knew what it was. There was no clutter. It's like there's the lure and there's the fish every time. And I've never had so much fun like trying to engage a fish on a flasher as I did with that because it was just like so clear cut one fish, one lure. I thought that was a blast. Oh, yeah. And, it's, and the thing about the flashers, what they teach you is how how the fish are reacting if they're if they're tilting down to look at you, um, they, they tell you so much more um, than anything else. They're absolutely amazing. And, you know, in the boat, I run my flashers a lot. I, I got Lawrence units, and I run flashers there. You can see when a fish does anything around your lure, and it is really impressive. Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, by reading those fish is how you learn to work your lure. Sure. I, yeah, I imagine the flasher over time with enough hours on the ice becomes such an important tool for that kind of presentation. Oh, I couldn't do it without 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 a sonar unit. I cannot do it. Yeah. Yeah. No. So, okay. So, let's let's let, let's talk about hoagies, man, because here's the way this went down, right? So, we started out with tubes. We caught a few fish. Your your wife caught, I think all of them, okay, in in the beginning. And I I remember it at one point, like I was, I don't know, I was talking to somebody and I turned around and you just handed me a rod with a nine inch hoagie soft plastic, which for people who don't know what that is, is basically a giant sluggo. Okay. With this big ass jig head on it. And, and I was shocked because that's an East coast based company, uh, that's big in the saltwater world. Everything they, they make is salty. And it was about the last thing I ever thought to see in the Rockies period. And I joked about being a guinea pig because what I didn't find out until later is that up until that point, you had not dropped one of those through a hole yet, had you? No, I did drop it through a hole once. <laughs> okay. I, I, I did one time on another lake over here, Green Mountain. We dropped it in there and we caught a fish on it. But that was the first time I fished them on Granby. And I got the idea of fishing them real shallow like that. That popped in my head that day. Ah, okay. So and that set me on a shallow water tear that to this day I can I look back and I cannot believe it. It's three years of just tearing fish up in less than oh the biggest fish I caught in the shallowest water was a forty three inch fish in less than thirty inches of water. Might have been two feet. So you probably told me at the time, but remind me, like, how did they even end up on your radar? How did they even get in your hands? I mean, I know they're not sold in stores out there. No, I was reading a, oh, it was some saltwater magazine, and they were, they called them Tarpon Candy. Yeah. And it was down off, the, off of Costa Rica. And I saw those things, and I'm like, oh, that has Lake Trout written all over it. So. I got online and I ordered them. And um, I think I might have had them in my hands for, I'll bet you, less than two weeks before you came out. <laughs> I remember, so after 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 we caught fish with them, like n n not long after that, didn't Hoagie, like they sent their whole crew out there to film with you again. You caught even bigger fish. And you were or still are like on Hoagie's pro team now, aren't you? Like the only ice guy I'm, on uh, it. I don't think I'm on their pro team i haven't um really I, I i went on that tear for a few years and i worked with ross gallagher and um they came out and did the video and then they kind of did they kind of died off on me they're not as effective as they were really um now well now you got i don't know how many people that are out on the lake bouncing those things around in shallow water <laughs> You you do you do a couple videos on something and Whoops, yeah. people see it and <laughs> you know that that's been the whole thing of my whole career is you find something that works and you use it and then by a guide you you got to show it to people well and then 
then you, you have to move on to the next greatest thing. Well, let's we'll hang on on the, on the next greatest thing if there is one because I want to talk more about that lore because you know I, yep. I just kind of followed your lead uh, without knowing the, sort of the full picture at the time. But like you said, there are a lot of rainbows in there, um, and then not only did you give me this giant lure that I was like, what the hell? Where we went to fish them, I I remember you drilled the hole, and I looked in it, and like the f-ing bottom was right there. I mean, right there. We were in three <laughs> three feet of water. Because I remember I was about to go put my flasher in, and you were like, don't. I'm like, what do you mean, don't? You're like, dude, look down the hole. Like, the, it's so shallow that the electronics wouldn't even have time to register the fish. So, like, there's no point. And I mean, this this move is, I think, really what sort of sets you apart. Because I know now, as I as I recall it, like we were shallow, but we were close to deep water. And I remember you saying, "Look, I don't know if this is going to work, but if there's a lake trout here, it's only here for one reason, and that's to grab something to eat and then boogie back to the deep water." And I mean, hell, man, we didn't jig that hoagie for 10 minutes before I I, I caught the biggest fish of the trip, and we had several more working really, really shallow like that. So the point is, I feel like in that scenario, you sort of treated ice fishing a lot more like deer hunting, where you put us where you weren't sure there were fish, but where you thought there could be at some point. And if we happen to be here when they are, like, shit's going to be awesome. And that's how I fish. That, that's a, I mean, you can't ice fish any other way because you don't know if they're down there. You just got to put in a likely spot and shallow water for me. I know they're going to be super aggressive fish. Um, and you just know what's going to happen, but will it happen today? And that's being a, being a trophy guy. One thing that you do all day, every day is you gamble. You just take shots and you hope like hell that it's going to turn out. And if you're lucky, it does. But I mean, would you agree? It's it's fair to say that it's harder for people to adopt that kind of mentality on the ice, just because there, there's in, in a lot of cases a lot more effort involved in ice fishing. It's like you know I got to lug all my shit out there. It's freezing cold. You know, too many people just want to catch a fish and sort of don't have that same drive to gamble on on the hard water. I see. You know, it's becoming a lot easier for people. Now, but back in the day, it was really hard. And, you know, if you book me on a trail trip, what I tell everybody, I go, if you want to go big, I'm not bringing anything to save the day. We're going to go big or we're going to go home and that's it. Right. Uh, you are locked into this to me and there's no no going back. Um, and so people do that. But now, you know, with all the information out there on the Internet and now you have all the um, electronic maps Sure. That, they, sure. that go all that data for you. Now there's so many people throwing caution to the wind and they're bouncing around the lake and they're, they're, a lot of people are catching fish, um, you know, by ice trolling or by bouncing around. Some people like to sit still and it's all working for them. Yeah. But, but that mentality up here is more prevalent than I think it is in a lot of places because people are understanding what they got to do. Sure, sure. Um, But, you know, there has to be obviously some correlation to doing what you do with Lakers, you know, for, say, the the, the pike or the the muskie guy. Or I'd imagine even the walleye guy, you know, in in some respects. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a whole mindset, and you just have to be willing to go, I don't need to catch a bunch of fish today. I just want one or two bites and I'll be a happy guy and I have to learn how to get those bites. Right, right. Well, so the technology has, has I mean, you and I fished together was only, what, five or six years ago. And, and I, I remember there were a fair amount of people on the ice when we were there and they were all sort of clustered over here. And I assume that they were all the people that were just wanted the bites. I don't know if they were on suspended schooling fish or whatever, but at the time, Wherever we were fishing, like there was, there was nobody else around. I mean, are you chased more on the ice now, and are there more guys consistently in the types of water that you want to be in where they weren't before? There definitely is, and I don't know. I wouldn't say I'm chased. Um, I would say that with like I've been doing this for so long. I have 
30 years of people that I've taught how to do all this stuff. Right. And so they're, they're following that lead and they're bringing their buddies up and other people are reading. I write so many articles. Sure. So all that stuff is coming around. And then with the, since they brought on the, the, the digital maps. Right. That, that is the one thing. Cause when you came out, I had my own digital map. Right. Right. And I, th- that was Dr. Depp to just come out with that stuff then. And very few people had it. Uh, very few people. So that opened up just, I could go to this spot exactly. I could go to that spot exactly. And now that the digital maps are out there for everybody, it's become so much easier for everybody to go find those spots. And you, that right now you drive out on the lake and one in three snowmobiles has a fish finder mounted to it, a right. GPS unit. Right. And so that kind of, that kind of is what it is. And I think that is what has brought so many people to so many spots and became, and given them more information on, and the abilities to find those out of the way little spots that hold those concentrations of fish. So you, you had said that, you know, things are, are kind of tough now. You know, you have to really work for everything you have and you might only get a couple bites. But I mean, in a way, I mean, that's the same thing you, you told us five, six years ago, you know, and I think we only caught four or five fish in two days with you, but they were, they were all tanks. But the numbers sort of match what you're saying now. But is it harder now? I mean, are, are, you, are you finding it that much more difficult than even, even not that long ago when we were there, you know, to, to consistently catch a big fish? And is that a, a pressure thing? No, you know, when you, when you put it that way, I romance the past a lot. Right. <laughs> and I wrote, just like everybody else, I romance the really good days. But the days you guys came out there and came out here and had are the same kind of days I had. You have now you don't get a lot of bites. You yeah. get, you know, a good day. You get three or four fish. You have one or two really solid opportunities every day. Um, and that's probably what you guys had. And I look back and I see, oh, my gosh, we, we might have caught eight fish that day. No, we didn't. We caught two. <laughs> Right. I'm just getting older. I, I just romance it more. <laughs> There's nothing you know? wrong. That's, that's, no, 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 no. That's kind of like when I was 20. I was built like a linebacker and absolutely great looking and funny. <laughs> I don't know what happened over the years. So, <laughs> right? Yeah, I, yeah. I hear you, man. I, I get it. I get it. So. I I did not realize that the hoagie thing went uh, that far and wide uh, around then. So if that – it's interesting to me that you've seen that lure that was so potent, um, you know, because there's so much debate over that, right? Like do fish really get conditioned uh, to lures? Um, you know, that's a, it's a topic that in all fisheries, you know, guys love to kick around. But uh, despite the size of Granby, I mean, it sounds like it, that's that's the case with those lures, yeah. I think it's over 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 the my career of doing this, I have came on a ton of hot lures that have been good for one to three years. Right. The only lure that has there's two lures that have lasted time and time and time again and one of them's a tube jig and this other one's this lure we tie out here um it's kind of a streamer kind of thing but the tube jig is really the only one that has been consistent for since the time it came out it is a one lure that if you're a lake trout trophy guy if you don't have an assortment of those four to seven to ten inches you're 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 missing the boat sure Sure. But now on the flip side, knowing that you're the, the, the constant experimenter and constantly trying to up your game. So it gets tougher with hoagies in, in that amount of time, man, there's been a whole hell of a lot of new school, wacky, weird, soft plastics that have, have come out. So I'm curious, like what were, like, what else had its two, three years in the sun since then? Anything in particular? Oh my gosh, a Berkeley jerk shad. Ah, okay. That little five inch bait, um, at ice off, throwing that over rock piles right at ice off from the boat was one of those baits uh, that accounted for more of my 40 inch fish in open water in probably as three to five years 
than anything else. We were catching at least one forty inch a day. Really? Um, yeah, and up to three, four, five a day. I caught. I got a, my biggest fish ever came on that a forty six incher. Huh. Um, it, and it was, and all you did was you put it on a three eight pound head, you threw it out, and you started reeling at a, a, a specific rate. Don't twitch your rod tip. Hold your rod tip at two o'clock, ten o'clock, and that fish is going to push it to you, and you better set the hook. And it was such a simple presentation; people couldn't master it because all you had to do was reel and not move the damn tip. <laughs> and then. You know, before that, it was it was just the seven inch sluggos. They were they tore them up. Um, before that, it was the bass assassins. Like a, those things were incredible. Like a straight tail or a paddle tail? Uh, no, no, the straight tail. Straight tail. And did yeah, do, and, do all did all those lures carry over onto the ice, Bernie? Oh yeah, yeah. Every one of them carried over on the ice very well. And it was and it was like I said, it would last. Two, one to three, four years, five years, and then then it would become very difficult to catch fish with. And you know, I still bring out all those lures out with me. And when I'm struggling, I go back to them. And every once in a while, they well, like last year, um, last year the jerk shad was coming back and it was making a pretty strong showing. And now this year they're kind of ignoring it again. That's so interesting, man. It's it's fascinating to me because I, I see how that can happen on a closed system, even though it's a big system. But I see a lot of the same thing um, with stripers here, not in the ocean so much, but the ones that run up the river to spawn here in the spring. And I feel like my entire life, I shit you not, every spring – it was like throw out what the hot thing was last year because they just won't eat it anymore. Now, is that entirely true? Does it do nothing? No, but it goes from, you know, it was, God, it was Sabeel Magic Swimmers one, one spring. If you didn't have that, pff, nothing. And then they won't touch the damn things. And now it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, red fin plugs, but they have to be loaded with uh, mineral oil and drilled out, like, and to talk about it, it sounds like that's insane, right? Like, come on, the fish are not that friggin' smart, but it, but it's reality, it, but it does happen. Yeah. I, and you know, and that's why I was kind of curious, like, um, after the hoagie craze, there's just so much emphasis on, on swim baits now, you know, Kai tech and, and, you know, a lot of these hand pours and things. I, I was just wondering if any of that stuff sort of jumped into the game, but it doesn't sound like the like the paddle tail sort of swim bait deals vertically through the ice were ever really the, the jam. Do I have that right? No, there was the paddle tails. When I first started this, we would get the I think the sassy shad paddle tails in a four inch yellow and black. Ah, super old school. We would. Yeah, and then we would what we would do is we would cut down the center with a razor blade okay and we'd put probably i want to say it was a three-eighths or a half ounce uh spire head in them okay and then we glue them shut interesting and when you when you did that if you you and you had to you had to do all this perfect everything had to be cut perfect if it was off at all it would work but if you if you figured out took the time to do it all right and you glued it shut when you went and jigged that thing up and down, that thing would dart way out of the hole. And then fish would just come in and rail it. So it was a matter of um, balancing it to sort of swing wide when you jigged it. Yeah, yeah. And you needed enough weight on there to keep that the sassy shad wobble and that tail going. Which is interesting because if you look at the old school sassy shads compared to the stuff out there now, they're like a... a freaking piece of concrete man in terms of like flexibility compared to some of the materials we have now exactly but no, um, none of this the sort of new like um you know ribbed swim bait sort of sort of sort of deals that everybody raves about like say in the bass scene um that stuff hasn't really infiltrated the the laker scene no i haven't seen a lot of it yet um i haven't seen a whole bunch of it yet and i see a lot of guys trying I make custom lead heads for people, uh -huh. and 
I'll get a lot of guys coming over here and they'll bring me a plastic and they'll say, can you make something with this? And will you please not tell anybody about it? <laughs> and, and I won't, I mean, if you want, if you want that secrecy going on, I'm there for you because I get it. Sure. Sure. What, um, what, what, like, what is the shape of the lead heads you're making? Like what makes them sort of dialed into what you do and what, what, what separates them? Well, the big one I'm making now, the biggest seller I have now, is it's a tube jig mold, but the lead sticks way out from the front of the hook to keep it more level in the water. Gotcha. Okay, so that puts the eye like further back on the head, not not coming out of the nose, sort of deal. Correct. Very, very. That's exactly right. And um, and then the guys who, oh, like some of the swim bait heads I'm making for people now are. Like the darter head, right? Um, that 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 helps keep so many swim baits real level in the water, how a fish would naturally sit, and they kind of they they cover more ground when you pull them up and down. If you're jigging them, they'll cover a little more ground for you. Um, it's it's just it's that kind of thinking that I'm trying to install on these things, and I don't know. People seem to be liking it. <laughs> so what's the you know, this whole thing seems to center around soft baits for the most part. But I, I know you, and I know that you've played with everything over the years. I mean, what's what's the weirdest thing you've ever tried? <laughs> oh my! Um, I had one time I was on this kick where I would get salmon roe. Uh huh. And I made a little mold that looked like a fish. And I kept on playing with salmon roe and gelatin, trying to make a solid <laughs> salmon roe lure. And I was just sitting there going, if I can figure this out, I don't know how many hundreds of dollars I wasted on this crap. <laughs> but I sitting there going, if I can figure this out, and get it all right. I have a lure. Every lake trout loves every trout loves salmon trout roe, salmon roe, right? Everything loves that stuff. Now if I can put that in the shape of a fish, and you should have saw some of the disasters I had. <laughs> um, you know, any any time you turn into that guy trying to invent stuff, you're gonna have problems. Well, yeah, and you, uh, you don't have a supply of roe. Like you don't live on the Great Lakes. Are you just like buying jars of of like the little trout eggs and just like going Doctor Frankenstein in the kitchen? No, no. We we have rainbows up here. We can get roe from, and we have kokanee salmon. I didn't think of that. Okay. And there used to be there used to be some good runs of kokanee up here. So you'd have to go work really hard to get your annual supply. And I'd be trashing it trying this and trying to invent stuff with it. Um, other things I did, I got to thinking about lake trout and how light and they hit and everything. Yeah. And so I, I experimented with a lot of the Velcro, you know, the, the loopy part, and thinking that if a fish bit into that, it would stick in their teeth for a second longer, <laughs> and you could set the hook and, you know, give you a bit, a little bit of that. Um, what else have I done? How did that go over? That, that, that didn't do it either, huh? It didn't seem to work as well as I thought it was. But, you know, you can picture it. You can see where that might not be a bad idea. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you something um, funny, man. I'll tell you how, how much, how, 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 how little of a bad idea it was. When I was at ICAST just this past summer, it was a small company making them, but I, I'm always, I always gravitate to the little guys because I think they, they make the coolest stuff. No bullshit, man. They were making hollow body bass frogs with Velcro on the back for that very reason, thinking that it, yeah. it would get yeah. caught in their teeth and it would just be there a second longer so you'd screw up less hook sets. And that, they, I'm so they, far ahead of my time. They, oh, they, owe, you, they owe you <laughs> money, man. That's Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, no. I'm not going to go there because if this don't work, I'm going to owe them money. <laughs> we'll just true, call it even right true now. True story, true story. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, let's we'll see. What else have I done with this stuff? I don't know how many plastic. Oh, oh, I used to use, and it, this actually worked really well for a while. I would get marabou feathers. Yeah. And I would put them in soft plastics into um, the sassy shad heads or the jerk shads or the, the tubes. 
and I'd put them in there and I'd use marabou's as their gills and their fins because that would be the one thing that'd be moving on the fish. Oh, I like that. And so I'd use sewing needles and I'd thread the marabou right through the the plastics and then I'd trim it off. Wow, to, so to the, to the size and the, what I what I wanted. And that worked. That worked really well for a while. Wow, so when it's sitting was, there horizontal, like the gills are still breathing because that feather never yeah. stops. Right, right. Wow, that's and, great, and it was man. All, everything I did was real subtle. I would use like zonker strips on the top of this stuff to make that the dorsal fin. Um, I'd put a little zonker strip on the tail just to make that tail, if you were dead sticking them, to move a little bit. You know, I just, that's kind of what I, I did that for a while, and I, that was pretty impressed how that worked out for, for me. Did, and I don't know why I got away from it, because I don't know if it ever quit working or if I just didn't do it anymore. Right, 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 right. Well, so did <laughs> did any of your uh, gelatinized egg fish, that roe fish ever make it in the water? Because I I remember, like, I saw this cookbook once from, the like, the 50s, and I don't know, maybe you've seen this, like, these old cookbooks where like people used to make like a salad and then encase it in jello, like gelatin, and then you like cut a slice of clear salad out of a ring mold. Like that's what I think of with what you're doing here. Did did any stay together long enough to get in the water? Well, they got in the water, but they fell off the hook immediately. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was. I cannot tell you how much of a disaster it was. <laughs> Because you've messed with Roe. You know how oh, nasty yeah. that is. I do, yeah. Okay, I was doing this on my kitchen counter mm-hmm. at home. Mm-hmm. You know, there was times you'd walk in that house and go, oh, my God, this stinks. Yeah. Who killed what in here? Yeah. Because yeah. I, I would do it till late at night, and then I'd go to work, and then I'd come back and work on it again. And when you're immersed in it, you don't understand how bad it is until it hits you like a freight train when you're walking up to the door. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Although I can, I can one up that because I went through a home skin mount taxidermy fish phase, which, you know, you're working on that shit for days at a time. That was a very short phase, but you know what? Despite that not working, like I appreciate, dude. Every single thing you just said, I'm like, shit. That's if that had worked, that could have been genius. And dude, the marabou on the soft plastic, I got. That's why aren't more people doing that? That's not that difficult. That's great. That's and that's easy and all it is. You know, and I preach this to everybody. I go, whatever you're imitating with your plastic, whatever you think you're imitating, you got to make sure to imitate it. Right. And then when you look at your plastic, it doesn't hurt. Like, um, there's a guy that Joe Butler, a great fisherman, you stole the brown trout record out of Flaming Gorge. Right. He taught me to, when, when they only had two colors of Rapala's, it was a gold and black and a silver and black. You remember those days? Sure, sure. Well, he, sort he of. taught me to grab the. Yeah, you might be a little young for that, <laughs> but um, that was a compliment right there. <laughs> you, um, he, he taught me to put red and black dots on the black and silver one, right? And it looked like a rainbow. And it and what was it? What would it be? Black and yellow dots, or black, yellow, and red. I'll put a red stripe for the rainbow of black dots and then put black and red dots on the black and gold one for the brown trout. Right, right. And that that changed a lot of stuff for us. And then I was watching in Fisherman one time, and they, they were fishing walleye on the Great Lakes at night, and they were putting that reflective tape on the side of their Rapalas. Yeah, yeah. And so we started doing that out here for brown trout, and it was incredible. And so, you know, once you start looking at modified lures and you start seeing the success with them, you're willing to experiment a lot more. You know, you take what you hear about and you go use it and you, it works. So then, then you start looking at, okay, well, why can't I do something with this lure, whatever it is? Sure. sure. And then you find out it works. Well, that's the fun of the whole thing, man. Um, you know, yeah, and, and, yeah. and people Some get away people... from that, you know. Uh, I, I, I do it a little bit with certain things, but, but by and large, you know, there's just, there's just nobody. Well, first of all, there's so many options now for one thing, but I don't know. I just, I don't find that many people that, 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 that bother to tweak like that anymore. No, I think part of it is there's so many options people don't think about tweaking. Right. You know, back, 
back when I still had hair and I was good looking and funny, <laughs> we, uh, we, we had our two choices of Rapalas and we had to do stuff to them. Right. You know, I mean, back then that sassy shad, that was the newest, latest, greatest thing. So we had to fi- figure it out. We had to figure out what to do here and there and all that other stuff. Um, now you just have so many shapes and colors the idea of modifying something is hard to come across. Sure, sure. No, and but it's still it it. And I tell people this when we, when I talk to them about modifying lures, I go, "Don't reinvent the wheel. Just add a little bit of air pressure to that lure, or take a little bit out. You know, do something real subtle to it. That's going to be your big big change." Sure, sure. Well, so you know, you are well versed in lure modification, but you also. Um, done a little bit of tackle modification that I want to talk about because, uh, you know, as, as a big fish guy and there's other reasons for them, I, I want to talk about the rods and reels that you use just a little bit because, um, they are, they are quite different from what most ice fishermen are using. And as I recall, at least at the time, they were all custom, were they not? And they, I used to use all custom rods. Um, now there's, there's even a whole, bunch of very good lake trout stuff out there right. like clam right. they have a 45 inch jason mitchell heavy rod which is the perfect big fish rod but that didn't exist it, it hasn't been around no. for that long right no 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 back in the day we would get rods and we would cut them we'd break rods right and i knew rod the rod builders and so they would make me 45 48 inch custom rods it's the medium medium heavy spinning rod and um put cork on the end of it and call it a good rod. Yeah, because, I mean, I remember, you know, you're using full-size reels. Like, you're not using, you know, small reels. You need them. You need the line capacity. But, I mean, beyond the backbone and the presentation, I remember you saying, you know, if nothing else, like, a longer rod stops you from having to be friggin' hunched over a hole all day long. Like, it just made it more comfortable you know, to fish, especially if you're putting in a long day, drilling a million holes and running all over the place. Oh, yeah, yeah. Them longer rods, when you can stand away from the hole, you're not looking over it. It's so much easier to fish. It's so much easier on your back. You have more hook setting power. There's a lot to it. Now, I'm going to throw a twist to you right now. Okay, throw it. We're using ice fishing rods in the boat, jigging for lake trout all summer long. You're talking about the, the, the longer ones, but the same ones you use on the ice. Yeah, yeah, we're using. I'm using a 45 inch Jason Mitchell rod um, in the boat all summer long, and the reason I do that is you get spot on presentation. Well, you know, I'm not as shocked as you probably think I would be because I feel like uh, in the last few years, because I, you know, I deal with a lot of other writers. You know, Ross Robertson, who you know, he's done pieces for me about essentially open water ice fishing, like whether it's a matter of, of not having ice all winter long and still wanting to stay on the game or more, you know, more specifically, like write it ice out when the fish are sort of still doing their wintertime thing, but there's, there's no more ice guys immediately go to open water tackle and he's still using a flasher. And it sounds like you're still using one too. And it's still that same vertical presentation. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it, it does, and it's just when when you when you shrink them rods down, right? It gives you so much, so spot on presentation. You've been in a boat with before with people where they start jigging with a six or a seven foot rod, and pretty soon they're lifting up a foot too high and stuff. Yeah, it is. I I know exactly what you mean. It it is easy to overdo it when you're jigging, even though you don't think that you are. You don't realize how the rod translates to the movement of the lure. Right, and then when you shrink it down, it's so much. When you shrink that rod down, it's so much easier to get it right. Interesting, interesting. So, considering right that to this day, uh, the fish that I caught with you were the most badass ripping fights that I've ever had on the ice. I've never caught anything that big through the ice again. Um, you know, how do you coach somebody? What's 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 really any any secrets or tricks? To doing that, because I think that a lot of people who are targeting walleyes and perch and bluegills, whatever, you know, you're more it's kind of standard ice fishing, I guess. I mean, you know, a, a lot of people aren't doing this and catching a 40 plus inch lake trout. So, 
you know, what's what's different, if anything, in the in the the fighting of that fish and the landing of that fish successfully, you know, versus doing it in open water? Patience. Okay. Patience. That that's that's a big deal. So you you're sitting there fishing, you finally get that bite. You got to you got you got to reef on that hook. You you got to hit them fish. You just got to be absolutely pissed at them fish when you hit them. Uh, once that goes, you got to get on that reel. And I always tell people on the ice, I'm like, you set the hook, you feel that fish on, you start backing up, walk backwards. That's just like reeling in, and until you get the hand, your hand on the reel, and then you can fight the fish. But if you're if you're fumbling your hand, reaching for the reel handle, that fish can come off. He's going to swim right at you and come off. So they walk backwards, and they get they get it all in, under control and work up to the hole. And then it's generally it's a tug of war. That fish takes drag, and you got to lift up on the rod and reel down and lift up. And everything at that point is real slow motion. You're lifting up real slow, and you're reeling down to catch up. That's a little quicker. Then if the fish takes off, that's when you get a break. But the minute he turns around and relaxes or gets a little tired, you got to start pumping him back to you. Then when he gets up by the Oh, that's when they get stupid, and that's when bad things happen to fishermen, because they're looking right at you, and you'll see them. You'll see them doing this. They're looking right at you, and their mouth is wide open, and they're shaking their head back and forth and back and forth. And if you put too much tension or not enough tension, it's over. Then they start swimming around. Then you got to get them head up in the hole, and that's where all this is. Just you know, you got to work patience and opportunity but then once you get them head up, head up in the hole whoever's going to land that fish needs to have a leather glove on and that fish is going to open its mouth for a second and you got to jab your thumb right in his like lip in a bath right and then you then you can pull them out because the last thing you want to do if you get a big fish and you're going to be letting it go the last thing you want to do is touch them gills i mean that's sure. just a kiss of death for a fish. she'll sure. swim away but if you use a, a leather glove and you reach down there and grab that fish, you won't pull back a bloody stub, and you'll be able to lift that fish. I, 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 I can't tell you how nervous I was in that few seconds, like after the fight of that first one, when you take over and then like the rod man can't see what's going on anymore, and it was just like a holy shit, like this three seconds right now is going to make or break this whole thing. Like seeing a fish that size come through a hole that small in the ice is, is one of the coolest things. And it, it, it upsets me that there's not something close to home to chase like that. You know what I mean? Like there's really not that many opportunities to, to, to reef on something that big uh, with the exception of muskies, which is, I don't know, it, you can do it, but it's, it's not the same kind of active fishing that you have. Yeah. Lake trout, they trout there. The thing about the cold water makes them an exceptional ice fishery. Um, it's absolutely phenomenal. And it, it is a bummer that more people don't get to experience it. But, you know, somewhere not that far, well, a short airplane ride from where anybody lives is some great lake trout fishing, whether it's up in Lake Champlain, whether it's the Great Lakes, whether it's up in Canada, or whether it's down the Rockies. Right. Um, there's a big horseshoe around the country that has them and you just got to do your research and go learn it. And if you don't want to go by yourself, you need to do your research on some guides and get some guides out there. Um, but I think the biggest thing you can do for yourself is do the research, figure out when and where, and then read a whole bunch of magazines, articles, and then go do it. Sure. Sure. Do you see, like, especially considering that you write, you know, get, getting back to those those clam rods you were talking about, like they didn't exist a few years ago when I fished with you, but now, you know, clam has a longer rod at the, at the, that's the right, um, you know, diameter and speed and everything to do this. So do you see, um, you know, aside from Granby, is there a sort of a younger culture cropping up around this sort of this sort of game, sort of how they've adopted in the swim bait culture? There's a lot of younger guys now that are willing to sacrifice numbers to get the ones they want the way that they want to get it. I mean, are you seeing that expand to, you know, the lake trout range wherever they are? Oh, in a big way, in a huge way. Those guys are really taking over in their they're 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 finding out new techniques and they're doing some really cool stuff 
And that's just it. They're willing to go fish for one or two days, one or two bites a day, or no bites, maybe one or two bites and three trips. And they're willing to do their homework and learn it and really figure things out. We got a group of guys out here in Colorado. I can think of about a dozen of them that are young and hungry, and they're taking their machines, their snowmobiles, their eight TVs, whatever they got, to all these lakes, and they're just every day off. They're living at the lakes, and they're putting up some great pictures on Facebook. They go through dry spells, but then they then they hit a they hit a shot, and they're all coming up with their own little their own little ways, their own little lures, their own techniques, and they're doing really well with them. Yeah. Um, I almost I almost start to think that a lot of this trophy lake trout game really lends to the young guys because they're hungry, they're not stuck in a rut, and they're willing to experiment. Well, and now they're going to listen to this, and they're going to start jamming marabou in their plastics and putting Velcro on shit, putting it on YouTube, <laughs> saying they came up with it, getting 2 million views, Bernie. That's what you've just done for them. Well, dude, more, more power to them. More power to them. Because I don't know. You know enough about me that I really don't understand. I'm, in, I'm social media. But I really don't understand a whole bunch of it. If I did, I'd be... I don't know, it'd still be me, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, you know, if, if somebody takes some of these tips that we're talking about and does something amazing, I hope I see it somewhere down the road in a magazine or somebody texts me a picture or something like that, because that would be absolutely phenomenal. That'd be really cool. Quick aside, I know a lot of my people know exactly uh, what that is the theme music from, uh, but for those that don't, I'm, I'm sorry for you. I'm so I'm so sorry that it wasn't um, a part of your life, right? I mean, like, hearing this means nothing to you, and, and that's terrible. And this right here is not what you thought a fistfight sounded like as a child. Anyway, Bernie is a legend, man. He is such a cool guy and and ranks in my top five, without a doubt, of, of the most fun fishing guides I have ever fished with. For, you know, the simple reason, and I've said this before, that the best guides are the ones that never get shook, okay? They don't ever complain. They don't ever get flustered. Even when they know that what you're doing is a long shot, they just exude confidence, and you lap it up, and not only do I believe that that atmosphere leads to success more often than not, like you just stay stoked to the end, even if nothing happens, and you walk away going, damn, I had fun today. Now, of course, we were successful with Bernie, and I kind of went back and did some math um, after I recorded with him and realized that I, I said in this that I fished with him five or six years ago, and that, that is false. Uh, I did some math, and it was nine years ago. Man, like, you know, don't don't you hate that? Like, where does time go? It all just mashes together in your head, and you, you can't remember. Like, it just all blends together, okay? But it was actually nine years ago, which which does a little bit more explaining, I guess, of, of how the technology and things have changed. Because, um, yeah, nine years and five years, big difference there. My bad. And, yes, that was my first time on the ice ever. Uh, you know... Ice fishing is not something that I grew up doing. And while I guess you could kind of say it's popular here where I live, um, you know, like I said, you can go years without fishable ice. So we've never exactly maintained the same kind of ice culture in eastern PA and Jersey where I grew up that, that rivals anything that you, know, that you guys in the Midwest or upper Midwest have. You know, now I think way back in the day we might have had it. Uh, you know, I talked to my old man. He says, yeah, you know, in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, like it, it was it was cold as shit around here from Thanksgiving to Easter, pretty much like clockwork. But even still, you know, he and his circle of fishing buds, they were not ice guys. So this is something I, I kind of found on my own later as I got into the fishing industry and met more people that were into it, both local and across the U.S. In fact, uh, the only time I ever attempted it prior to meeting Bernie was in high school, one time with an old butt of mine, and we got a wild hair to uh, try it one winter that was frigid, but of course we had no auger or gear or any of that shit, so 
we just uh, moseyed out to this pond with an axe. And uh, we got there and both went full on chicken shit. And we're uh, too scared to actually walk out onto the ice and start hacking away at it, which was likely for the better. I might not be here. Who knows? So I mentioned earlier that I just wanted to briefly touch on um, Laker Ops locally, right? Because here's what's going to happen, because it always does. And it's one of the reasons why I love each and every single one of you guys so much, okay? This will drop, and I will get 10 messages, okay, about Laker Ops, many of which on lakes I've probably never heard of in Pennsylvania or New Jersey or New York. And it's going to be, dude, you know, come come up to Lake Hiawatha, Askabaska, Pasaukeeburg, and I'll get you on them, bro. Okay, first, I might. So don't threaten me with a good time, damn it. But look, I, I'm not... I'm not aware of, like, every single fishery that exists for every single species out there, right? Like, I'm, I'm human. So, yes, I'm sure there's stuff uh, I don't even know about that's fairly close to home. But when I say local, I, I tend to mean, like, day-trippable, okay? And what I wish I had was Lake Granby-style laker opportunities close to home. Now, there is a Round Valley Reservoir, in New Jersey, which is, I don't know, about 45 miles or so, 50 miles from my house. And um, it does have lake trout in it, you know, and there's a fairly robust stocking program, I believe. It does have lakers. Um, do they catch them uh, as big as the ones Bernie has? Not really. Um, I wouldn't exactly call it a trophy fishery, but be that as it may, you know, never once in my life, honestly, have I mucked with the place during open water. Because it is a big, deep, giant bastard. And, and you know, sort of the, the big lake trolling jigging scene isn't one I'm really plugged into. Don't really have any friends that do that. You know, I have salty friends. I have river jet boat friends. I have musky boat friends. But the deep reservoir scene, not so much. Um, and the interesting thing about Round Valley, at least so I've been told, um, is the way it's sort of positioned, right, in terms of direction and the fact that it's so wide open and very windy, um, it is extremely rare, even during the coldest winters, for the entire thing to freeze. Okay, is that 100% accurate? I can't say that to a T, okay? But people that do a lot more ice fishing than I do uh, have told me that. So what happens there is the coves and stuff freeze, but the majority stays open. And uh, the one time that I ever ice fished on Round Valley, that was the case. You know, some buddies and I took a swing, um, in one of the coves, you know, one winter, mainly just hoping for the smaller trout species in the shallows. And, uh, shit, we couldn't even, we couldn't even muster up one stock or rainbow that day. But, um, the ability to run around, uh, and fish how Bernie does just doesn't normally exist here. Okay. Uh, let's forget about the, the fact that it doesn't always freeze over completely. Um, this is New Jersey where you are legally not allowed to own or purchase a slingshot. And that's a fact. Not kidding, okay? So taking a snowmobile on a lake in a state park, uh, I don't think you can do that. I think it's like an automatic five years in jail or something. I, I don't know. I'm making it up. But like when it comes to outdoor and gun laws and stuff, New Jersey's terrible. We're terrible. Uh, point being, you know, if you look up ice fishing for Lakers in uh, Jersey on YouTube, there's not a ton of videos, right? Not a ton. And the majority of the fish you see caught are smaller, you know, you know, 16, 17 inch fish. And it's not that I need like, you know, 50 inch, 40 inch giants per se. But again, when you hear Bernie talk about the years it took to really dial in his fishery, right? Well, hell, the problem here is that, first of all, you can't cover water on these bigger reservoirs and things because you're on foot. Uh, and even if you started to get something dialed one winter, hell, man, you might not get back there to upkeep your level of dialed for another three years or five years because you just can't count on good ice here. So, you know, it's not that zero lake trout opportunities exist. It's just a tough deal. It's it's not sort of the, 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 the rock'em sock'em deal that so many other lakes, uh, you know, like Granby and Champlain and stuff, um, have, you know. Although, uh, funny side story to my one and only visit to Round Valley, that day while my buds and I hung with the masses in the old boat ramp cove, uh, dude, these five Russian dudes showed up 
and like it was no thang at all, walked, I kid you not, a mile out onto that ice, literally to the edge where it met open water and set up chairs and fished off that edge like the ice was the beach and the lake was like the the, the surf gently lapping against the shoreline. Like, it it was us and a whole bunch of other people in this cove real close to shore, and these dudes were these teeny tiny little specks way the hell out there. And I thought, well, either they're insane or um, they legit know what it takes to catch heavy hitter lake trout on the ice in New Jersey. But uh, we left before they did, and I didn't hear anything in the news, so I assume that they survived. Anyway, I can't thank Bernie enough for dropping his Laker knowledge on us. He is such a solid dude, and just having this talk alone with him has me itching. No joke. Not kidding. I had so much damn fun with him that that maybe I'd actually welcome some, some slight outpourings of offers, people. Who's dialed on Lake George or something? You guys, you know, you guys got ice up there? I don't even know, you know? Tempt me to ditch the fam for a few days in February. I'll bring the beer. I'm a pretty good time. Most of the time, you know? So, hey, for all you guys already on the ice, uh, I hope that there was a little takeaway in this for you, something that'll help you out or help you dream a little bigger. Uh, I hope your flashers uh, stay fired up. There's fire in the hole. They stay flashy. I hope those flags are flying. Uh, And I will catch you guys right back here in two weeks. And as always, thanks so much for listening to the Hookshots podcast.